It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio. Flavored with a dash of humor. Welcome to intelligent, irreverent talk about plants and the planet they grow on. Your questions, comments, and participation are always welcome on Facebook and Instagram at The Mike Novak Show and at Mike Now on Twitter. Good planets are hard to find. Temperate zones and tropic climes. And true currents and thriving seas. Wind blowing through breathing trees. Strong ozone and safe sunshine. Well, good planets are hard to find. Good planets are in the main. Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Jet streams, perfect air. And here they are, Peggy Malecki and Mike Nova. Good planets are in the main. Right. I should have kept it up just a tad longer to show the uh, spring beauty because, uh, ah. but we're going to be showing another picture of spring beauty this morning. So there you go. Uh, at, welcome everybody to the program. All right. I'm going to adjust here. Uh, I'm still messing with, with the audio levels here. I, you know, hmm. you, you, you tell me sometimes I'm a little distorted and, and, and I'll tell you something. <laughs> As an engineer, <laughs> as, as an engineer, it drives you crazy. Yeah, because I'm looking at the, the the meters kicking and they're like spot on. It's like then and then we get to uh, I get to listening to it and you know I'm too loud or I'm too soft and I just like come on man, this is uh, so let's just adjust so just a but, little bit. But the problem is the internet gods are in between. Uh yeah, I guess there's something about that. All right, I'm pulling this back. Just Gremlins. see what. Yeah, love the gremlins. Hey, let me show you something here because uh, we're talking uh, we're talking gardening today um, in the first part of the program with uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world, uh, especially when it comes to gardening, and uh, that's Beth Botts, who is uh, anybody who's lived in Chicago for any length of time and who is a gardener knows who Beth Botts is. Um, she is. She she's uh, an award winning writer and author and has written for the Chicago Tribune for, or well for a long time and she used to actually get paid by the Chicago Tribune and now mm-hmm. <laughs> she's she's laughing you know maybe I should just maybe I should just bring you in Beth Botts uh, right now because she's sitting come in come on her, down uh, Beth Botts she, uh, she is a. Uh, uh, sitting in uh, her own backyard, we're th- we're we're tempting fate here because we decided to, uh, and and in fact you and you can hear birds chirping and and the audio hum at the same time, which is just a I'm not sure that's a wonderful combination or maybe not. the birds are humming. Yeah, um, it's because they don't know the words. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yes, thank you very much. I I need to get uh, no. I think uh, <laughs> what what we what we play there is. There we go. Uh, Beth, <laughs> you don't often get a rim shot when you do a garden talk. So. <laughs> Especially when you walk no. right on. Yeah, yeah. you get the rim shot. Uh, no. But, no. you know, I wanted to bring you in right away because, you know, uh, this is what I want to show you um, that came out of my garden this morning. Uh, wow. Thanks, thanks to Kathleen. That's gorgeous. Isn't that wonderful? And there's wow, a, they're open already? Wow. Well, we're just a couple. Of, are we okay? Oh my goodness! You know what I forgot to do? We're gonna to have to start over. Uh, no, wait, no, what? we're not. No, no, we're no. We're on Facebook. We're on Facebook. We're streaming. I don't have any YouTube. You don't have YouTube. Okay. okay I'll, I'll just. All right. Kath, Kathleen Facebook. came down and said we're not on YouTube, and uh, and so we're streaming on Facebook. Uh, because everything else here is, is up and yeah. streaming. The rest of it's there. We got people watching us on YouTube, saying good morning. Yeah. Waving folks, at us. Folks. I mean, on Facebook. Yeah. And Periscope too. Yeah. No, actually, we've got YouTube. Kathleen, there's two people on YouTube we watching pe- us. We have people on YouTube, so I'm not sure what. The, well, she's the one who's responsible. Bruce, Dan, you guys, Bruce and Dan, you guys are on YouTube, right? She's the one responsible for uh, 
taking it from the signal from YouTube and putting on the website, which we have to kind of do manually. Oh, we've got Dan Cost is watching on YouTube. He said hi. Bruce okay. Bruce is waiting right. at us. Great, great, great. So uh, no problem. See, you know, this is the way it works. Kathleen's upstairs doing stuff there. And anytime I see her walk through the, the downstairs doors, her, I go, uh-oh, problem. And sometimes yep. she's... Dan, Dan says we're on YouTube, so... All right, good. So we're up on YouTube, great. And, uh, and we, you know, it's just, it's always, the first five minutes of the show are just total panic mode every week, uh, <laughs> just to make sure that, right. Uh, that, uh, in fact, yeah, you know, you know, uh, I can tell, what, okay, she's giving me the thumbs up there, so that, yep. that's, that is good. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, Snappy J Dog's watching us on YouTube, too, she says. Yeah, um, because uh, what the... Um, what the first five minutes of the show are like every week is something like this. <laughs> okay, that one gets a... <laughs> Can I borrow that, please, for, for Zoom meetings? I need that for Zoom meetings, please. That, that's a new one for my, my brother. No. My brother sent that to me, and I, wait, wait, we just have to look at that one more time. I know exactly how he feels. Oh, oh my boy. goodness. Uh, that's, see, that's not, oh, the, boy. that's not the friendly marmot we have on our poster no. that, that Peggy uh, uh, is still fixing, right? Yeah, but you can't see behind me anyways with this. Uh, so, oh, you're going to make excuses now. Okay. All right. So uh, no marmot poster today. So I, I've got two natural awakenings posters here. I could put behind uh, me. I, I would have to put you uh, sure. Go for it. You can, you can, uh, you can uh, pl <laughs> plug your own entity, your own outfit. That's, that's fine. So let's get back to uh, this, which is this wonderful and look at the, there's a little bit, I don't know if you can see it. What's cool about there's a this look in there. Yeah. A, a tiny bit <laughs> of red right in there just a wow. hint, hint which is so cool um and yeah a lot of peonies are like that they have a little white peonies they have a little bit of that hot pinkish red thing going mm. on in the middle yeah or yeah. you know and there's a lot of bicolor peonies that cultivars that have streaks or spots or a different center or something yeah you want to give you have sun for peonies Go to town. If I had sun, I'd have a lot of peonies. Well, I don't have sun. That's the thing. Here's the deal with my peony. Well, All right. Here's the, here's the story. I planted that in my yard, um, and then I planted a, a cornice mass right next to it. Um, and when the peony first got planted, it was in sun. And then uh, mm -hmm. over, and, it's, and it happens to a lot of people. They plant a, 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 a lilac say and and they and there's an oak tree nearby and 30 years later they go my lilac doesn't bloom like it used to i wonder what's wrong with yeah. the lilac <laughs> like, nothing wrong my with the lilac's lilac. in total shade yeah. and it's blooming just fine so yeah could be yeah. the variety too i've got a lilac in could, it could be what kind of lilac it is if it's a meyer lilac it's more likely to bloom in shade than if it's an old-fashioned yeah i've got know, grandma's lilac yeah so uh that is a deal and by the way uh beth i'm just going to let you know uh and i'm not i'm not going to make any deal of it after this unless you just we lose you completely um when we did the test uh on friday uh it was yes. perfect everything was just perfect and by the way let's get a shot of beth's yard here so we can just see uh where she is here in her this is uh her uh, place in oak park and as you can see, it's definitely a shade garden, which is one of the reasons we're going to be talking shade. Um, so when we did the test on Friday, everything was the audio, visual, uh, video was just perfect. And of course, it's glitchy this morning. So this is the way. Okay. But, but your audio's fine. And and All since right. since this gets turned into a podcast, nobody cares about anything um, ab about okay. the the video. Uh, so there we go. Um, so there and, we go. There we go. So uh, there's Beth Botts, uh, Midwest garden writer, author, and, and, and that title that I have there really doesn't do you credit uh, because uh, you've been around forever and you've written so many things and, and you've edited. Uh, you, you, you and I worked together at the late, great Chicagoland Gardening Chicago Magazine. Chicagoland Gardening. We did. Yeah. And uh, 
we'll give a a, a ding uh, in memory of uh, Chicagoland Gardening, and and and, and I want to start with that actually because it's something I've been play taps. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Either that or we'll get the marmot again yeah well that's what i was thinking is because you know um when um we we got the word that uh the magazine was uh going to have to fold uh that's what everybody was doing ah! <laughs> yeah ah! <laughs> But you know, Mike, if you've been in print journalism as long as I have, yeah, about three quarters of the publications I've ever written for are now defunct. Really? And and hmm. the rest of them are shaky. So. Um, and that and that you know, includes the Chicago Tribune. That is Chicago Tribune, which is especially this week. Key moment now. Yeah. Yeah, they are about to be uh, bought by a uh, a hedge fund. Uh, which is not exactly good for journalism right now. Yeah, well, certainly the other hedge fund does not have that. Re oh, ah! <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Ah! <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Get the hook. Get the hook. <laughs> okay, stop it, stop it, stop it. All right. Uh, All right, Marmot, you can leave the building now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, and, and as you say, print is, is, is a bit shaky uh, at the moment, and uh, that's that's kind of the way of the world right now isn't it Beth? yeah it kind of is i mean the the internet really kind of sh uh, shot the heavy print publication business model and nobody's figured out and there i am on the internet with my my hand on my nose yeah, yeah i'm telling you we we the, we had everything was perfect on friday oh there you are and at least now uh, well, there we, i am i'm back i'm definitely glitchy i'm i'm jumping and i'm delayed and everything but i'm just going to decide not to care about the uh, the video uh yeah print publications are uh you know a, a very hard time figuring out how to make a living and how to pay people yeah. and uh there are a lot of people who have, remember when the chicago tribune was a big rich corporation and the papers are still big rich corporations there's about uh Three papers in the United States that are still owned by big rich corporations because they have Jeff Bezos behind them or yeah. something like that. But Those you know, papers and most print magazines are in a really bad way. Yeah, you know, and and uh, having Jeff Bezos, uh, um, a gazillionaire, uh, owning a journalistic enterprise. I mean, he he might have all the greatest intentions in the world but the problem is we don't know um and yeah. and uh and so we're sort of stuck with that and i don't think that's yeah. a that's a good thing um on the other hand there was an article that uh i posted just the other day about uh the tribune and how uh some of the rich people in chicago had a chance to save it and did not step up um and so the hedge fund right. guys got their greasy palms on it and so now we're yeah. going to see what happens so uh you right. know beth what we're going to do here is we're uh i'm i'm going to tolerate this a few more minutes and if it just seems like it's w something we can't bear i might send you back up to your apartment um uh, okay. even though i like the uh, the backdrop it's really lovely I'll, uh but you know and now suddenly it's it's see i threatened the internet and that's what happens yeah okay be very, very yeah. quiet. So anyway, uh, okay. we want to talk a little bit about gardening this morning um, and, uh, and, and shade gardening, in, in fact, uh, uh, because you sent me uh, uh, 800,000 photos this morning um, and uh, Peggy sent me uh, 200,000 photos yesterday. And uh, so I've got a lot of them uh, popped up already and and how many photos did you send, Mike? I I have six, uh, and uh, <laughs> no, maybe seven. There might be seven, um, but I wanted to just talk about some of the basics of gardening. Shade is one of them because a lot of folks deal with shade all the time. Uh, as you can see, Beth, in the background there, you don't have a choice about what kind of plants you're going to put in there. You're not growing a prairie in that area in Oak Park, are you, Beth? 
No, this is this is a very yes, it's a suburb, but it's a very certain kind of environment similar to what a lot of people are dealing with in the suburbs. I have over here a four-story apartment building. Over here, I have a six-foot fence that belongs to my neighbor. You got to bear in mind how much shade when you're yeah. building your privacy fence. That's going to create shade. And then overhead, I have a whole strip of trees. Which again, are, are down the fence side. I have no control over that. Yeah. All right. And so you and we. Have... I'm gardening under the tree tree canopy. Yeah. Uh, and we have no control over the internet. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go to a break. Okay. I'm going to go to a quick break here. Let's do our, our first break. Um, and uh, let's have you grab your machine there. And uh, you just take it uh, up to where the signal's better. Uh, because this is too good. I want to have a good conversation here. And uh, we're not, it's not going to happen this way. So that's, uh, go ahead and do that, Beth. And, uh, and she's doing that right now. And <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye. We'll see you in a few minutes. Um, good. And then we're left with the, the image there of the backyard. Uh, we don't need the, uh, the real prop. Uh, so here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll take this break and it's a shame. Well, yes. I was going to say, we could also talk about Chicago excellence and gardening awards while let's, we're taking let, the break too. Let's do that. Let's start with that. Okay. And then I can go into the break because there's something I wanted her to uh, see at the end of it. And yeah, we should let people know that the spring version of Chicago Excellence in Gardening Awards is uh, ongoing uh, right now. And um, that would be the 60 second garden video challenge. That's right. Um, and uh, you can go to chicagogardeningawards.org and enter wherever you are in the world, basically. Not that I expect people from mm -hmm. Sri Lanka to, uh, to be entering our but gardening. But you can. You could. Um, uh, but uh, anywhere in the United States, and we have two sections. We have uh, the spring or sessions, I guess, the spring session and the summer session. Uh, and the spring session is open now through the end of June. So, um, and and we're going to show some plants that uh, are blooming right now. And some that are, actually, most of the plants we're, we're, we're showing today are stuff that you can find in a spring garden. Uh, so get out there, take photos, videos of your spring garden. you got 60 seconds to do it. We'll, we'll let you have a minute and two, I believe, and then we cut you off. Or and or we send you a note and saying, uh, yeah, you've got to uh, you've got to shorten that, um, and uh, we encourage people uh, from anywhere to uh, enter the contest. Uh, there are not fabulous prizes, but minimal prizes, uh, modest prizes. Let's, let us say, plus Mod fame and glory. Yeah, yeah. Um, Accolades yeah, uh, from your friends, and that's the whole point. Is because we pop them up on YouTube, and uh, you have to get folks to watch and then click the like button. One of the things we've discovered about YouTube is that a lot of people, you can get thousands and thousands of views and very few people will click like buttons. And then there's always those people who click the unlike button just because they can. I, I don't get those people. It's like you have to... But yeah, they do the thumbs down button. What? The, the thumbs down, right. It's like... Yeah. Why? You know, that I always I'm always amazed and there's like 7 million views and uh 340,000 thumbs up and seven thumbs down. It's like who are these people? You know, it's like a there's always some crackpot out there who who's who's who can't be pleased. Uh but I digress. Uh we want you to really? enter Yeah, we want you to enter the uh uh, 60 second garden video challenge go to chicagogardeningawards.org you can also go to uh the chicago excellence in gardening awards on facebook and find links there mm -hmm. um and then you just get out with your camera uh your cell phone uh your still cam whatever but you got to put a video together uh 60 seconds in length and uh and then submit it and so uh, we hope uh, folks will do that all right we are going to take a break um uh, and and I see we've got uh, uh, Sarah Batka. Hi, Sarah, from uh, Illinois Extension, is telling us about her peony in part shade. 
they do well enough. Yeah, that's what it is. It's they do well enough. It's not spectacular, but they do well enough. All right, let's take this break. And by the time we get back, I'm hoping Beth is with us. It's the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. We shall return. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. You can help slow climate change in 2021 by composting. And you don't even need a backyard. By composting communally in multi-unit buildings across Chicagoland, Collective Resource Compost has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. CRC brings you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter, they swap it out, and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectiveresource.us. From small boat fishermen to your dinner table with safe, free, no-contact delivery, Sitka Salmon Shares brings premium wild Alaska seafood to your door. They're a community-supported fishery offering shares just like your local CSA. All fish is wild caught in season with respect for the limits of the ocean. Line caught and traceable to their fleet. Use promo code NOVAK25 for $25 off the first month of a share. Go to SitkaSalmonShares.com slash N-O-W-A-K. Every exotic pest plant in your yard is a seed source, with the potential to create thousands of other pest plants just like it. Pest plants that destroy animal habitat, crowd out native plants, and cost millions of dollars to control. Yeah, from Florida. I know, I found that. I, I, lately, I've been searching for those um, odd sort of uh, environmental... PSAs that are floating mm-hmm. floating around on the inner tubes. I wanted uh, Beth to see that. It's interesting because uh, this is an older, although it it has a. Uh, um, oh, and there she is. I see her uh, lining the, the up. The message is perfectly good now. It's just an older spot. Okay. Yeah, okay. Wait. Hold on. Let's uh, let us get uh, your image. Hold on a second, Beth, so I can pop this up. Uh, and. Um, Okay, we can go there. Well, there you are, just a little off center. Um, but that's all right. As she adjusts, I can. In fact, I can bring. <laughs> Sorry about that. There you are. Yay! There oh, I are. Oh, that's so much a better. A little bit more in the middle, if you can. Yeah, let's let's get you uh, to in, your right. Move to your right. Even a little more. There you go. Now you're perfect. All right. Wow. Okay. All See, right. That was good. That didn't take too much, and and now we got all this time to talk till uh, till uh, ten o'clock, and we were uh, going to talk about uh, plants and, and garden. Yeah, I know it's uh, it's humid it out is there. August out there. Yeah. August in May. You got to uh, yes. appreciate that. Um, you, I don't know if you saw the headline uh, to the blog post I did, but you said that the other day, and I. And two things happened. I said, I wrote that down. Some, start with something simple and beautiful. Sure. Um, sure. And, and that's how people. And, and that's how, you know, beginner gardeners, you start with something simple and beautiful that you like, that you can be successful at. And then you'll move out from there. Um, because I was whining, as is, is my want, um, about uh, how, why um, some garden entities don't, preach the uh, I, the concept of habitat and native plants and the fact that uh, your soil needs to be um, uh, full of biology and, and and you know all that stuff Beth but you say that when a gardener starts they don't care about any of it basically well they don't know about it I mean they haven't they, have, they haven't figured out how plants work yet when you want to start as a gardener what you're fit learning is how plants work and Mm -hmm. how to help them work and how to be successful with them. And as you learn more about what plants need 
and uh, how you can supply that then your knowledge deepens and your knowledge grows and you start to say, okay, I had a pretty flower. What if I had a pretty flower that would feed butterflies? What if I had a pretty flower that would feed a lot of different kinds of butterflies and bees? What would that do for the rest of my garden? What would that do for the rest of the world? Um, you know, you, you work out from what you know and what you feel like you have a handle on and you get a handle on something more. Yeah. Uh, and the important thing really is when you said start with something simple and beautiful, I typed it in to my blog, blog post and mm -hmm. it gave me a very, very high SEO score, uh, which is all I, which is all I <laughs> sure. care. It's all I care about now. That's all you care about. You're, you're just a, um, a money grubber, a, a, a click grubber. Yeah. Well, well, wait a second. I'm not That's making any are. money. I just, I, all I care about. <laughs> oh, okay. A I click grubber. I'm a click grubber. Um, uh, and I was stunned by it because it gave me an 88 out of 100 and I've never had anything that high and went, oh, I'm going to go with that. Of course, then uh, when I did other things, it said, no, 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 you're doing this wrong. And I said, shut up. Just shut up. Uh, but um, so uh, one would hope that a gardener, even if they, even if they, um, they start with just something simple and beautiful is going to progress uh, to sure. that other stage, mm -hmm. uh, which is, the, I've always said, good gardeners become good environmentalists. Would you agree Absolutely. with that? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things about gardening is you when, you, when you have something beautiful and you take care of it and you become part of its life, and in that very small way, you become part of nature because, you know, you can't just uh, manipulate it the way you can, you know, manipulate a plastic flower. You have to give the, the plant what it needs. Mm -hmm. So you start to become nature, be a part of nature. And that uh, helps you then realize that you're part of a larger nature. And, and, and as, yeah. as as you keep gardening and you learn more about that larger nature, it leads you naturally to worrying about threats to that larger nature. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think you just made a really important point is that I think many gardeners think, uh, well, many people and, and not just gardeners say, well, there's nature over there and I'm over here. Yep. Uh, that is the great thing about gardening is it puts nature right in your life. Yeah. It's not something that you do that you that you make a trip in the car to a national park to see. Right. Nature is right there in your and your garden is, is not the wilderness. You know, your garden is a very contrived thing. Even your garden and my garden. We you know, we believe in native plants, we're doing everything we can. But still, because the places where we garden are so different from unspoiled nature, our gardens are even native plant gardens are very manipulated places. Mm -hmm. But what you learn is that you can only manipulate plants within their, uh, within the limits of what they need and with the limits of how they evolved, which have to do with where they come from, which are part of that larger nature out there. Uh, and I don't want to get too much into that whole idea, uh, but it is a, an interesting question. I think the great gardening question, one of the great gardening questions right now is, are we a world community or is there really such a thing as natives? Um, you know, if you look at the history... You know, it, it, that's a whole nother show, Mike. Yeah, I know it is. It is. And I, <laughs> that's like part I said, two next month. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but it is important to say because that there are a couple of camps on this. Um, I think Beth, you and I, and I think Peggy too, are, are in the same camp, which is we, we're moving towards as many natives in our yards as possible. But if I have a peony uh, and it and it's this, sure. if it's this beautiful, um, I want part of that. I want that in my life. Okay, that's sure. that's important. Um, I'm not giving up hostas and I'm not giving up roses in this little tiny patch of sunlight where I can grow roses. I'm, I'm going to, I want to have a successful garden that's pleasing and beautiful to me. And that's going to, that's not going to include just native yeah. plants. My goal is more native plants in more gardens. And, and I, you know, the way you, you get that is you help people figure out which native plants are going to work in the places where they're gardening.
Yeah, and that's another question too. Because yeah. and, and, and you don't tell them you have to take away your roses. And you don't tell them you have to take your your roses. And you don't tell them that you're you know you're evil for planting hostas. Although I have to tell you that uh, when I moved into this place twenty years ago, uh, the only plant in the yard other than lawn was a rambling rose on the fence that bloomed once a year and got had sure. no no scent at all pink and i hate pink as a color generally um although i'll, I'll tolerate it in a cone flower because i like cone flowers it's more they're they call them purple but cone flowers are really pink um pink. <laughs> uh but uh, I, I was never so happy as when uh, about three or four years ago uh the 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 rose got uh, rose rosette um oh. and, and rapidly declined and just and and it went away and i was like yay okay now okay. i don't have to try to keep that plant alive which takes us to the other question that you mentioned the other day sure. everybody who's ever grown plants kills plants How absolutely do, so talk about that a little bit well you that's how you learn you learn what plants can't stand by discovering what plants can't stand and uh you you learn i mean i'm a deep shade gardener you saw my my garden's about 25 feet wide 150 feet long about 80 percent deep shade mm -hmm. and in order to figure out that i had deep shade i killed a whole lot of plants that had been labeled as <laughs> part shade or semi shade or part sun uh you know it's it's a process but the thing you got to remember is Plants die all the time all over the world. That's why we have soil, because the organic matter that enriches soil is dead plants. So when you when when a plant dies, you're not doing you're not committing a crime against nature. A a, a dead plant is part of nature. The soil that is enriched by that dead plant is part of nature. So yes you're going to experiment and yes you're some of sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it isn't and as you um as you garden more and get better at it i'd like to say that you're going to kill fewer plants <laughs> you probably are going to kill fewer plants <laughs> sure. but also what it's going to what it's going to lead you to do is you're going to find out about more plants and that's going to tempt you to try more plants and um it's going to let let lead you to be tempted by more plants that probably can't grow where you're trying to garden. Yeah. So killing plants is just part of gardening or letting plants die if they're not the right plant. Yeah. I mean, that... It takes in order to figure out whether you've got the right plant for your place, you have to figure out what your place is like. And one of the best ways to find out what your place is like is by figuring out what kind of plants can survive there. Yeah. Which and and what kind of plants back can after the winter there. too. And what comes back after the winter and what thrives instead of what you wanted to have growing there. And you, so. Beth, you, Beth, you have a challenging place. Peggy has a very challenging yard and it, it changed recently because her neighbors decided uh, unilaterally to cut down a bunch of trees, which changed. And that was several years ago already oh, by yeah. now. So it's been slowly mutating into what's growing there. So whatever. And, and the Your peonies are doing much change. better. Yeah, the peonies, I imagine, are doing a lot better. Uh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, and, and that's the thing. Sometimes you open up sunlight and you're going to kill a bunch of hostas and, <laughs> because you had... So it becomes something else. So you give away your hostas and you start exploring, figuring out how much shade you really have and what you can really... Right. You know, a garden doesn't... Gardens change. Trees get bigger mm -hmm. and they cast more shade. Somebody cuts down... Trees die. Tree. Trees yep. die. Trees have a natural lifespan and sometimes... It's time to get rid of the tree. Somebody builds a six foot fence. Maybe you, maybe your neighbor. I mean, things change all the time. And our, you know, that's on top of our changing climate, which is another rabbit hole. Let's not get down. Yeah. Um, that's that's but, the, the next, next show. That's the next, <laughs> next show. Um, but, you know, a, a gar. A, experienced gardeners learn to roll with these punches and learn just you know okay 
all my hostas died. Uh, but now I can plant something else that I've been dreaming of for 20 years and never been able to plant because I didn't have enough sun. And if you're, so, and if you're smart, an opportunity. if you're smart, you're dividing your hostas. And if you've got an experimental location, you take that division and put it there so that you sure, still have the original there. plant uh, in case uh, yes. the other one died. And I have one of those oh. places, I like my parkway uh, in front. Yeah. Dry mm -hmm. shade, rock hard soil. Right. Rock and, hard soil. And all I've and done. And tree roots. And tree roots. And over the and years, I plant things. If you survive, you get to stay. If you don't, I right. try something else. And that's the, that's just the way it works yeah. out there. So. Well, yes, and that's interesting one, is. Go ahead, Peg. Sorry. I was going to say, as you no, experiment ahead, on some of it, as you experiment on some of it, or as the shade changes in the yard, plants you figured like some ferns, trilliums. They're still thriving yeah. in the sun. And you go, wait, this yeah. is supposed to be shade plants. Well, if you think about something like a trillium, I think you and I have a similar approach to shade gardening, which is we have a lot of the conventional shade plants like hostas and bruneras and so forth. But we're also using woodland wildflowers, native woodland wildflowers. If that's, it, am I correct about that? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Peggy? Okay. Yeah. So I do the same thing. And, um, one of the things to remember when you walk in an actual, in the forest preserves, in an actual woods in the spring, is that there are a lot of different conditions in the woods. There are dense, dark places, and there are sort of little clearings, and there's the part by the path, and there's the part farther away from the path. And as you walk through a woodland, it's constantly changing around you. And those wildflower seeds are all over that forest mm -hmm. and they will seek out the little patch of conditions that's right for them yeah. yeah and so the you know the they're opportunistic so the the plants in your um you know, the trillium in your yard may have you know may have a greater range of capabilities than you knew before um and now you're discovering something about the range of capabilities of that plant yeah, I, I you know uh, let's let's go to some of these photos. Uh, Pe Peggy has given me some of the trillium, and I look at the trillium her yard. They're uh, they're monsters compared to the ones in my yard, and I guess uh, my oh, it takes a long time. Yeah, uh, uh, so but let's start with something that you sent me, Beth, and this is what we were talking about. Here's your traditional hostas um, and a few other things. What do we got here? Well, this is this is actually not my garden. Um, this is because my hostas aren't sufficiently mature yet, but you've got a bunch of different cultivated varieties or cultivars of hostas mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, just to show the range of them. And, you know, when I first started gardening, I thought, oh, oh, shade, oh, hostas, I'll plant a lot of hostas. And then I got, you know, to be more of a gardener and I got more sophisticated. And I thought, oh, hostas are so common and they're so <laughs> boring uh -huh. and you shouldn't plant yeah. hostas. And so I started trying to plant all sorts of other things. And then after, you know, 10 years of doing that, I said, you know what? Hostas, because you know what? They work. <laughs> they will grow in deep shade and they give me nice colors of, of you know, different colors of leaves. I have a lot of different kinds of hostas and they, you know, they're, there's, there's about a zillion and a half, yeah. maybe a zillion and three quarters by this point of different <laughs> varieties of hostas. And, you know, they work. They are really a backbone for a, a shade garden. You know, if nothing else work, you can probably grow a hosta. And, and that's a problem with a, with a, a gardener who's been at it a while. Uh, and because sometimes those gardeners start to say, oh my God, it did not die. I am putting more of those in my yard. Sure. You, you, some is good, more is better. Yeah. Well, wait, some wait, is first. good, more is better. But the other thing is, you know, hostas are, uh, they have these big green leaves. It's sort of a kind of a, if you have enough of them in different varieties, it's sort of a rippling mm -hmm. sense of green. Um, and then you can use that as a backdrop or as a contrast yeah. for a lot of other plants. Sure. I said um, at a hosta convention once, 
I, <laughs> I spoke at a hosta convention once, and I said, <laughs> there are too many varieties of hostas in the world. And, and I said, there are oh, actually, my. there are more varieties of hostas in the world than there are actual hostas in the world. So it, it feels that way sometimes. It yeah. does, because who can name them all? It's just impossible. But you're right. They're workhorses. They provide what they're like a canvas. Um, they're a backdrop right. for a lot of other things. Now, here's something else you sent me. Uh, Brunera or Brunera, mm -hmm. however you pronounce it. Brunera. Siberian um, bug loss is supposed to be the common name, although I hardly ever hear anybody call it that. Nobody calls it that. Nobody calls Nobody it that. Nobody calls it that. Everybody calls it Brunera. And, it, you know, there are a lot of cultivars like this cultivar that have these nice variegated leaves. So you get that little pop of white in the shade. Yeah. And uh, in my experience has been that these things will recede. Yep. They spread a little bit in my garden, and they also send out runners. So this is another real sort of workhorse plant. Um, it, it works in most soils in the Midwest, and it lives a long time, and it does useful work. I, I have found, though, that the variegated types, as we're seeing here, are not as long-lived as the plain types, the 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 basic the straight species species yeah, yeah. I, I agree with that um, the and and also sometimes in really deep shade the variegation doesn't hold up as well yeah you got to remember that anytime you have anything other than green in a leaf it means a lack of chlorophyll which means that the plant a plant that has a lot of uh, white in it or a lot of red in it are can't photosynthesize as efficiently as a plant that whose leaves are all green. Yeah. And so sometimes the plant will say, okay, the heck with this, I'm going to make me some more chlorophyll and, uh, you know, make the most of the little oh, light that I've got. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You will see a lot of variegated plants that revert, uh, back right. to, to the green variety. I have, a a variegated rose of Sharon out front, which I like because mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to recede at all. Um, and I think it's because it's weaker because it's got variegation in it. And every now and then it sends up a branch that has the original green or the reverted to the green. And I just cut it off um, and, sure. uh, and, and keep going. Um, here's another very popular. And right now we're sort of in your – and f folks uh, listening on the podcast, my apologies. Uh, you might have to go to MikeNovak.net to uh, see the video if you want to see some of these photos. Or go to our YouTube channel. Or go to the YouTube channel. Uh, either way – you. You can see this, but uh, we hope we're describing these well enough so you understand what we're talking about. And we're looking at coleus right now, and apparently, coleus. Yeah, color uh, in the shade where where you can't where you don't want to plant impatience and you you can't get anything else to bloom. Coleus is a way to get color in the shade, and again, it's one of those plants that you know supposedly sophisticated people like to sneer at, but it works. You can get it cheap. Um, in the garden, um, if you have better indoor conditions than mine, you might be able to overwinter it as a house plant. And, you know, it does a job. It, it provides color in the shade where there's, uh, where it's hard to, to get other things to bloom because there's just not enough sunlight to power blooming. Yeah, it's, it's, it's and like... And it's an it's, annual. And it's an, well, it, yeah, it's an annual, although... Some people with really good indoor setups can overwinter it as a house plant. Yeah. But well, what I meant was but, it was an annual. So if you don't like it next year, you can put something else there. Exactly. It's a temporary plant. Think of it as a temporary plant. Yeah. Just, you know, put things in containers because when you put things in containers, you can move them around to find better conditions for them. You can uh, do it one year and then say, oh, that was ugly. I'm never doing that again. You're not, you're not stuck with them. So I have a lot of containers that are scattered in among my perennials um, because, you know, that's what I do for color and that's what I do for, for variety and change. All right. Uh, and here's another one that, and, and I'm not even going to be, you're right. There's a lot of coleus snobs. I'm not quite a coleus snob. I'm more of an impatient snob, uh, but they also provide yeah. color in, in the garden sure. and, in a shade. And a lot of people love it for that. Uh, here's a plant that I think too few people use, which is epimedium. Right. And this is actually in my garden. And 
Um, I think this is epimidium sulfurium, but I'm not really sure because I'm one of those people who I have a big shoebox full of plant tags, and I but I never actually <laughs> remember the names of the plants. Yeah, I'm this with is you. this is a great ground cover, and there are there are a bunch of different species, and you can't quite see in this picture, but in May they do have these wonderful little tiny. Um, there what? you go, yeah. little tiny delicate little bl nodding blooms. This, but mm. epimidium is really great as a ground cover. It's very drought tolerant. It's practically unkillable. And uh, it's called barren wart um, is, is a common name for it. Um, and there are some that have a little more red in the leaves and you know, they're very, they're, whoops, different cultivars and different species. But this is a really, really useful ground cover and it seems to be able to survive in pretty darn deep shade. And uh, here's bloodroot. Blood uh, yeah, now this is an example of, of those native plants we were talking mm -hmm. about, Peggy. Yep, I have a lot of those. And they're one of the first things to start blooming as well. Yes. Just gives you that wonderful, wow, flowers. Yeah, and, and uh, the other. The I need more of those from you, Peggy, by the way, I'm just saying. Okay. My experience <laughs> is now, this is a very a, a very rugged plant, and it it spreads in my garden. It recedes in my garden. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these leaves, it's got these big sort of leather, almost leathery. They have a a sort of velvety texture, big kidney shaped leaves. And even though the flowers go away in you know after they bloom in the early spring, the leaves persist, and mm -hmm. the leaves will persist for several months. And it actually functions essentially as a ground cover with a, a, a kind of an interesting leaf. Um, so it's, it's not, a lot of the things that will bloom in shade are those spring ephemeral ground uh, 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 wildflowers that disappear after they bloom. But this one is, the, is different because the leaves actually do persist and they contribute to your garden for several months after the flowers are gone. Yeah, that's what I was going to tell you, Peggy. You could see the leaves, so you could dig them up from the, the leaves, right? Well, they... a, lot, a lot of them are hiding now under the trillium. Ah, all right. Mm. Well, so uh, you gave me one the other year, and I put it in the parkway in the tough area, and it is surviving. Uh, go figure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got a couple out in the uh, kale in the vegetable garden. I can... Uh... I'll, I'll try and pot one of those up for you. All right. Now, speaking of natives, uh, this is May mm -hmm. apple. Are those uh, trout lily? Those are trout yeah. lilies. Um, I have to say this is an old picture on the trout lilies died. I'm okay. sorry to admit this. Mm -hmm. But the May apples are still there. Yeah, you can't and, get rid you know, of them. They're, they're an interesting plant. They've got this big sort of umbrella of, of leaves, and they are very you know, very persistent. They're very hard to kill. Uh, they're growing in like the darkest part of my deep shade, and they're just. But they also grow in sun. They will, they also will grow, grow in. in yep. They won't grow in blazing sun. They won't grow in like prairie sun, but they'll grow in part sun. Yeah. yeah. And they're thugs. They can be thugs in your yard too, because they send they they send uh, uh, runners um, mm -hmm. underground, and I have every year. I have to dig up a huge batch of them because I have a tiny yard and they will colonize the whole yard if I let them. Um, and I do not yep. let them. So um, it's... Sure. You go in the woods and you see these, these great big, mm -hmm. you know, 50 foot yeah. across patch of May apples. So this, uh, this gives yep. the lie to the idea that a, a native uh, cannot be invasive uh, in a small... Well, a, a native... Now, let's be really careful how we use the word invasive. In my yard. How a about native, that? <laughs> a native can be aggressive. Yes, aggressive. But aggressive. But, I mean, invasive... Re the word invasive is really about plants that invade natural yes. areas. Yes, yes, that's true. A and may apples have a right to be in the natural area sure they do but they're they, not invasive they only in have your a yard they may yeah, be aggressive that's right they are aggressive and they don't have a right to take over the whole yard uh in not okay. my yard but uh you know here's another one that i mm -hmm. i have these in my yard and they pop up all over the place and i love yeah. them they, they self-seed easily sell, they self-seed they're yeah they're fabulous and sell, i we need a name I need a name celandine poppy okay celandine poppy and uh, 
I have these all over my yard. They reseed everywhere. And you know, a a lot of these plants, another plant that reseeds everywhere is something called Virginia water leaf, which I don't think I managed to send you a picture of. You are allowed to yank out native plants if they are in inconvenient places. It's your yard. And uh, usually what I do is I wait till these things are past their first flush of bloom in late April and May. And then I go through and I exterminate all the ones that are in inconvenient places. Yeah, I did. I've uh, been transplanting celandine poppy uh, this spring. Uh, they, yeah, I got a couple of them that just got to be huge, and they're gorgeous. Mm-hmm. You know, and I hate to take they're them gorgeous. out. Gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, but, but if I, they're in the wrong place, they're in the wrong place. Well, uh, and I've moved them to other places, so you can do that. Um, and the, the wonderful thing is, if, if you cut them back, the uh, they'll rebloom. Not yeah, as pro- not, not as prolifically as they do in the spring, but they'll rebloom later, and uh, they'll get more compact again. So you can train them. I mean, you can cut them back, and then they 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 they'll they'll be smaller and more in place. They won't, you know, they'll flop after after a while right. if the leaves get large enough. And the other thing you learn about celandine poppy is they have orange sap, and if you not they careful. Do. You mm-hmm. will get orange sap all over your clothes, so you have it to. It is be... an excellent <laughs> argument for, but 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 we all wear our grubbiest clothes and our gloves in the garden, right? No, uh, no. no I, I usually wear a sport coat while I'm gardening, but uh, there is a photo sure. of you watering tomatoes in a sport coat. Mike. There is. Remember the, that. There is a photo. There is? Yeah, oh, yeah. There, absolutely. Ooh, yes. Oh, these are gorgeous, and these are late fall. And These I, are way late fall. This is not a native plant. This no. is from like Formosa, mm-hmm. um, but, and it, or Taiwan, as we call it now. It's a toad lily, and I it's have called a toad lily. Yeah. I love them, and I have not had them in my yard for too long, and I don't know why I don't have them. But you're right; they're not native. And Peggy's right. One of the reasons you love them is they bloom so late. They're just such a welcome. Uh, addition to the garden at that time of year, uh, later in the the year, and and by late we mean we mean mid to late September, and they'll keep blooming until frost. October. Yeah. S- speaking of late yeah. bloomers, um, yep. This is tur- like my turtle, head. turtle head. Turtle head. But that's we- the non-native turtle head, right? Uh, this is Shalom glabra, and I thought that was native, but uh, all if right. I wasn't yeah, I know the- my iPad. Somebody who's uh, who's watching, because uh, uh, the white the white ones are native. I think these might be let borderline. Us, I'm not sure. Whoever I know, some of our listeners and, and viewers can tell us. Uh, do a quick research. Let us know if this is a native or not. But uh, again, late in the season when you need some color or you mm-hmm. need some blooms, uh, and and the wonderful dark leaves. Uh, I I just got some on sale uh, real early in the spring. It was on the 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 sale table. Uh, at a local uh, nursery, uh, independent yeah. garden center, I might say. So, and they uh, come yeah. back year after year after year. They're very dependable coming back. Yeah, uh, I'm going to do one. We're skipping seasons here because if we go here, here's uh, sure. sp- Spring Beauty, mm-hmm. which is a native. Um, and uh, we, uh, uh, Beth and I, a couple of years ago, before <laughs> COVID and everything else, went to. Uh, the uh, Morton Arboretum together, uh, where Beth works and writes, and um, and we went uh, just walking in the woods, and I was taking shots of trout lily and spring beauty, and it's just uh, pretty fantastic in the woods there. Yeah, it is. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Morton Arboretum in Lyle, which uh, pays me my weekly, my bi-weekly salary, is... Um, a wonderful, wonderful place to see wildflowers in the spring. The there, there's a substantial portion there of oak woodland which is being restored, and uh, you know uh, they're they're working really hard to to restore the native oak ecosystem. And it's really the whole range of possible native wildflowers. Uh, are there and mm-hmm. and those are my favorite trails to walk you can see a lot yeah. of these native wildflowers in a lot of the forest preserves and a lot of other places but for sheer density and variety of wildflowers uh i i think the arboretum is the place to be 
And, uh, of course, there's uh, the Columbine Canadensis, uh, which I love, because, and I have it in my yard. Uh, hummingbirds like it. It recedes prolifically. It's just delicate and beautiful and a wonderful mm -hmm. addition. And, and most of the plants we're looking at here will do pretty well in the shade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. They'll do pretty well in the shade and they'll, I mean, I, I wouldn't have sent you these pictures if they didn't do well in my shade. <laughs> um, these, I will say that I used to have just boatloads of uh, Columbine, this wild Columbine in my yard because it receded everywhere. I am not seeing as many this year, so yeah. I might have to actually go out and buy some seeds or something and, and reboot the system. Uh, yeah. Because they're one of those things where, you know, they're just, they pop up everywhere and they're welcome wherever they pop up. Yeah, that's what I do. I let them grow pretty much anywhere they show up. It's like, okay, this is this is one of those plants I don't consider invasive anywhere, anywhere it comes up. Uh, it's just uh, too wonderful. Uh, let's, let, let's look at Peggy's garden real quick because she sent me... Sure. Uh, a bunch here, and uh, Peggy, take it away. Ooh. Jack in the Pulpit, which self-seeds all over my yard. Mm -hmm. And these are short ones, but I sometimes have Jack in the Pulpit almost three feet tall. Wow. I've got a nice one coming up uh, in my yard. I need more of those. Uh, see, Peggy is my supplier. She's my, my uh, junkie dealer. And uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, she gets me uh, Jack in the Pulpit and uh, Bloodroot and um, Trillium. Uh, for my yard. In fact, the trillium, they're popping up all over the yard. Now, I, Jack in the pulpit, eh, I've seen, I've got one I've, that's fantastic. I've, every so often you so get what, it where you can tell where the seeds fell and there's like eight of them in a row. Right. Um, and uh, um, this is, I have this in my yard too, uh, wild ginger. And what is that with the wild ginger, Peggy? Trillium. Oh, that's the trillium. That's okay. red trillium. Yeah. Yep. I, yeah. Red trillium is everywhere in my yard and then there's everywhere. a front too um and in fact here's another uh great shot uh, by the way the wild ginger that that's another one that'll colonize like crazy i have a mm -hmm. wonder it will what, i have a wonderful you'll see mine a little later on but here's more you can see more of the red trillium and see how tall it is mm -hmm. in peggy's yard there next to the fountain that's uh, pretty cool mm -hmm. stuff peggy um and um uh, anything you want to add about the the trillium no, nope, they're just the, um, they'll keep going by yeah, end of June. They start looking uh, a little ratty, but yeah. they keep going. Yeah. Bluebells. Uh, Virginia, Virginia Blue Virginia Bluebells. Yep. I, I, okay, I have a place in my yard. Okay, I planted them on one side of my yard, on the west side of my yard. Uh, and they're okay. You know, people always say, oh, you're going to have to rip out all those Virginia they're Bluebells. They're everywhere in my yard. Well, they they kind of do okay there, and it's not been an issue. In fact, uh, I wonder if they'll survive there. Uh, and then suddenly, on the east side of my yard this year, boom, there was this huge patch, and I don't remember planting them there. Um, and they're, and they <laughs> they've started to move. They've started to move, and they love it on that side. So... Uh, well, but, they receded. They maybe they receded to a place where the light is a little bit better for them, or where the soil is a little bit better. That's for what them. I'm thinking. Something like yeah. that. And yeah. one, one thing about my yard, I have very old arborvitae and very old oaks. So mm -hmm. that's the basis of a lot of my soil that isn't just the hard packed clay, which is the rest yeah. of my yard. And there's right. your wild geranium. Yeah. Is this which our... also are everywhere mm -hmm. in my yard? Is that geranium maculatum? Yes. Yeah, okay, because I have ger geranium. All right, uh, uh, we're almost out of time. I want to get a couple of shots in from my yard because one of the things, okay, let's do a comparison. Compare and contrast here. Uh, let's see if I can find the photo here. You self-seed regularly, too. All right, this is a, a shade. Come on, pop up. There we go. Uh, this is geranium mac macrorhizum. Uh, right. which, is, which is not a native, and boy, that will take over a yard. That's at the base. Well, that's, that's, ever. Your, that's your, uh, those are alliums there. I know it, but the but what's the back. The alliums are at the front, but the pink at the back yeah. is, big, ah. is big root geranium. But see, those don't take over in my yard. She can't those, get them to oh, grow. Oh, they do. Yeah, and I can't, and I, and I have to keep ripping them out. I rip them out every I year. Have, 
You, and, you gave me a huge pile of them a couple of years ago. I've got one left that that survived. Wow. Well, I got plenty more if you want them. Uh, those and and you're right. Those are allium. They used to call them bulgaricum, and they changed the name on mm -hmm. it. And I can't tell you what it is anymore. Yeah, mine are it, just starting right now. Now, just uh, starting over. Here's something I want to show you that is kind of fun. This is uh, speaking of. Uh, um, oh, that's that long columbine. spur columbine. And I don't know how that got there. All right. I just, uh, it just showed up. Um, it's seeded one and, day. It, and it just is fabulous every year. And, and now look in the geranium macrorhizum. This popped up just this year. So it's reseeding hmm. itself as well. My little, uh, uh, and, and one other shot, and then we're going to have to uh, call it a day. Um, one of the things I love about shade gardener sedges, you can put mm -hmm, so yes. many different, and, uh, you can see on the left, that's my Herbert azalea, and, and again, not a native, but it, it's one of the few azaleas I've found that, that actually gets larger, a little bit larger each year. It doesn't just waste away. It can handle the alkaline soil. Um, wow. You, you can see the sedge. Uh, bottom left is uh, uh, violets, and bottom right is wild ginger, and I let them duke it out mm -hmm. to see who's going to survive. Sure. Yeah, you just let them. Yeah, but, but the sedges and the grasses are great. I've got that all over in the shade too in between ferns uh yeah so whenever, whenever you anything you can have so many of the shade plants have big leaves the standard shade plants like pastas and brunera they have big leaves and so anything you get that brings that finer texture the <laughs> grasses or the ferns or anything like that um is is going to make your garden more interesting yeah so yeah. Uh, one, of, one of my favorite ferns is um um sensitive fern because that just kind of winds yes. its way through things. yeah you sent me yeah. some photos of that I, you know you put i put it in my yard and it disappeared it just uh it didn't it didn't take it didn't establish Soil, probably well i think it was yeah. water it was one of those dry summers and it just didn't make it through. i kept trying to water it and it would bounce back for a while and then it just completely disappeared so i'll have to try that again uh, we're out of time um how about that okay beth we got to do and, this and yes i was gonna say scott's calling us all shady gardeners by the way but um, uh, uh, yes, that, in that every sense of the word. That that is that is Scott Jameson. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Scott. Uh, Beth Botts, what a pleasure talking to you. See, we got to do this again soon. Beth, at one time, we used to fill in for me, of course, when there were engineers on the other side of the glass and that sort of right. thing. Um, but that's back. That that those are memories now. Those are, <laughs> those days are long gone. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, so let's do this again very quickly. Anything in particular working on that uh, folks should look out for? Well, I do work uh, at the Morton Arboretum, and I write a column for the Arboretum um, f that appears in the Chicago Tribune on Thursdays. I do a lot of talks to uh, garden clubs and so forth. You can find out about that at my website, thegardenbeat.com. Um, I do have a book that you can find in... Ah, oh, right. Bookstores uh, or Amazon, wherever books are sold. Um, and I have some other things I'm working on, but that's enough. <laughs> well, I put the uh, the name of the title of the book and the link on my website so folks can find that. And it's, uh, it's, it's uh, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio gardening what's it was it month, month by month, month by month in illinois indiana and ohio yeah so uh folks it's just, uh, it's just basic garden uh, advice it's yeah. nothing complicated but i'm told it's pretty good <laughs> i know it is uh i have a copy of it uh, floating around here somewhere beth Botts, thank you so much it's such a pleasure to see you and we'll talk very very soon okay Good All right, to you. coming up next, we're talking about bye bye. Cl clean energy in Illinois. Stick around. It's Monday morning and your car won't start. What's the first step? Find out what's causing the problem. Or, better yet, find someone who can. It's impossible to remedy an issue without first determining the cause. And when there's a problem with your tree or shrub, that's where Bartlett Tree Experts comes in. We call it Plant Analysis and Diagnostics. We'll start by accurately identifying your tree. This is important because a tree species will indicate its typical traits and tolerances, as well as any susceptibility to insects, disease, and other stress problems. Next, we'll look at the tree from the ground up. 
We'll check the condition of the soil, examine the root collar for decay or other issues, look at the color and health of the foliage, and inspect for damaging insects or disease. There's a lot to consider when making a correct diagnosis, and your local Bartlett Arborist has some unique support, a team of top scientists at the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories. We can collect soil or plant samples from your tree and shrub and send it to our lab for analysis. Our lab analyzes over 20,000 of these samples each year, so you can count on an accurate diagnosis. Our lab also functions as an education center for our arborists to receive ongoing training. So after diagnosing your tree problem, we can also provide the most advanced arboricultural techniques and treatments to help solve it. Successful plant healthcare is all about timing and early detection. If something is concerning you about your trees or shrubs, don't hesitate to let us know. We're happy to help identify the trouble with our expert plant diagnostic services. Welcome to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Green, gardening, and environment radio with just a son of humor. Or is that a dash? Brought to you by Bartlett Tree Experts. Every tree needs a champion. Go to Bartlett.com. Here they are again, Peggy Malecki and Mike Novak. All I need is good food to eat and make me healthy, wealthy, wide awake. Lettuce, tomatoes, root, and bacon. What about those sweet potatoes? All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good food to eat. All I need is good tools to make me music. Whoa! And there, that went away. Welcome back to the Mike Novak Show with Peggy Malecki. Boy, <laughs> you can tell how well I had things set up for uh, for this show uh, today. Uh, welcome back, and and there's our guest uh, uh, for the, this segment of the program. Uh, my apologies to you, Colleen. We ran a little long with uh, Beth Botts to see. We start looking at photos of our our plants in our backyard, and of course, uh, we we start to geek out. But uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, Colleen Smith is Deputy Director of the Illinois Environmental Council, and um, the reason she's here... Oh, and let me just say, good morning. How are you? <laughs> good morning, Mike. I'm doing all right, and I, I loved the segment. It was wonderful. I spent a lot of time uh, around my plants yesterday in beautiful weather. So. Oh, great. Right. That's good, yeah. And and, and I tell you, uh, you're pro if you're like me... You're going to welcome just slightly cooler weathers. Let's let's bring the temperature down just a little bit because uh, it always makes me nervous, especially in the uh, the era of climate change when we're getting 80 degrees in March, April, May, um, at least for extended periods of time. So um, I'm happy to have things cool down just a little bit. Um, but the reason that Colleen is here is because it's going to be a busy week in Springfield, Illinois, with the Illinois General Assembly, um, and as they and you and other environmental organizations, um, and then everybody who's working on any kind of legislation whatsoever, and that's part of the problem, too, is that you're trying to pass environmental legislation, there's all kinds of stuff going on, um, the you have a deadline of May 31st to get a bunch of things through, including um, a, a, a bill uh, that will promote clean energy in the state of Illinois based on the back uh, uh, or riding on the back of something called the Future Energy Jobs Act, which passed in 2016. Um, and I've been doing some reading about this. There was an article uh, you and I talked the uh, just the other day, Colleen, when we were setting up the signal here um, about um, an Inside Climate News Sun Times special report that just came out and said, you know, we're we need to pass this law now to follow up on the Future Energy Jobs Act. Um, it was supposed to usher in this new era of clean energy in Illinois, but there were a few glitches in the act. Can you explain what happened over the past five years? Yeah, certainly. And thanks again for, for having me, Mike and Peggy. It's wonderful to spend a Sunday morning talking about all things clean energy in Springfield. Mm -hmm. As Mike pointed out, it is going to be a long eight days. Uh, I'm headed <laughs> back to Springfield tomorrow uh, through Memorial Day weekend, like every year. Um, you know, the biggest difference in my mind about where we're at today with clean energy conversations and where we were in 2016 is really the outsized influence that the utilities had in 2016. Um, you know, 
being significant stakeholders with seats at the table dictating what clean energy policy should look like in a way that benefited and that, them. And that would be Exelon and Aaron? And, and ComEd, absolutely. And, Comed, um, yeah. and even the fossil fuel generators, I would say, uh, previously have always asked Springfield for a bailout. And I remember in 2016 and 2017 and 2018, just trying to fight them not getting anything. And now today, after two and a half years of working with communities throughout Illinois, having a really strong governor and leadership in the General Assembly, um, it's time to have clean energy that is dictated by what people view clean energy in their own backyard as and passing a bill that is written by those communities and not um, a bill that is written to protect utility shareholders. Yeah, and this is part of the deal that happened in 2016. Um, sometimes people talk about the 800-pound gorilla in the room. I would say this is the 2.3 uh, <laughs> uh, billion dollar uh, gorilla in the room, which is um, uh, ComEd, which received $2.3 billion in ratepayer-funded subsidies uh, based on the 2016 bill. Uh, as you said, they had uh, undue influence in 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 what happened then um and uh that was to prop up a couple of their nuclear generators mm -hmm. um you know there are there are folks like uh dave Kraft at the uh, nuclear energy information service who we've had on the show and it's it's about time we had him back too because uh, he would he he has said you know what why are why are we doing this i mean he's he's a, a person who says that you can call nuclear energy clean and yeah it does not pump carbon into the atmosphere but we do not have any idea of how to deal with the waste products mm -hmm. from nuclear energy so you're saying now that you don't think they're going to have as well in the meantime since 2016 last year especially there was a scandal involving pay to play and and the former house speaker illinois house speaker michael madigan um, has that reduced the influence of ComEd in these negotiations this year? Without a doubt. They are not able to, uh, to be serious contenders in what energy policy should look like because of those indictments. I think it's clear that they were not serving the best interest of their customers. And, you know, when we look at whether it's the formula rates or any number of other policies that have traditionally benefited them and their own profits, uh, I, I don't think there's an appetite in Springfield to pass that type of energy legislation again. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the, meanwhile, uh, they're not the only player here. The governor's involved. Uh, there, there are several bills, clean energy bills, that are all competing. Three of them. Uh, at least three. Are there more than three? Or is it <laughs> six? Yeah, there's yeah. quite a few. Wow. Yeah, but the three. I I would guess the three major ones are the governor's bill and the the path to 100, which we've talked about on the show with Lisa Albrecht from the Illinois Solar Energy Association. Uh, they support that bill, and of course, um, you support the uh, Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, can you? briefly outline what the difference is uh, of, uh, among those bills and why you support uh, CJA. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as, as we were kind of just remarking, there are six or seven energy bills. You know, you, the Path to 100 is the energy bill developed by the renewable industry, which looks very focused at just how do we expand renewable energy and get to 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. Clean Energy Jobs Act obviously takes a much more robust approach to energy policy. Uh, it includes many of the same provisions as the Path to 100, but CJA, as we call it, also includes reducing pollution from the transportation sector, decarbonizing our power sector, uh, expanded workforce. You know, it's 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 much more comprehensive Equity. than the Path Bill. Equity, absolutely. That is something that I think we think is missing from the path to 100, that if we're going to expand the renewable industry, let's make sure we're expanding it so that people who haven't had the opportunities to participate are able to, not just you know, jobs and job training, but real wealth building, entrepreneurial opportunities. And I would say the governor's office has taken a very similar approach, and they've 
you know, really looked at a lot of what's in the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, you know, their focus is on putting consumers and climate first. And we're really grateful that the governor's office bill also holds utilities accountable, has equity at its core, uh, and a strong decarbonization schedule. So it is not perfectly aligned with the Clean Energy Jobs Act, of course, but over the last couple of weeks, there have been significant negotiations with stakeholders and you know, the stakeholders we want to see dictate clean energy policy, not utilities and fossil fuel interests. And I'm confident that we'll be able to get somewhere um, on clean energy before May 31st. But Mike, one thing you pointed out was uh, the conversation around nuclear. And, you know, Dave Kraft is a friend and a member of IECs. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about this. Illinois mm -hmm. currently gets 52% of its energy from nuclear sources. It is significant. And while we believe nuclear can be a, a bridge to a 100% clean energy future, and especially focusing on coal plant closures and natural gas closures uh, before we, we get to nuclear plant closures, but if we're going to be giving any kind of subsidy, it has to be based in reality. Is it needed? Does it help us advance our clean energy goals? And I think the governor's office uh, in their independent audit of Exelon's financials, you know, made it very clear that they will not sign a bill that gives the nuclear plants uh, a bailout that they don't need. Uh, one of the things that uh, <laughs> folks should know about this is this is none of this is easy. This is uh, if there's uh, and it's as you know, compromise, <laughs> right? It's everything. Well, that's that's the way, you know, the sausage is made. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the 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 issue itself is is rather Byzantine. Um, and, 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 and if you look at all the different players in it and all the different requests they have, including nuclear, including social justice being a, a very big part of the seizure plan, I think is very important. Um, and then you look at the path to 100 and, and what uh, Lisa told us back when we had her on in December was that they were concerned. Lisa Albrecht. Lisa Albrecht from the I Solar Energy Association, Illinois Solar Energy Association. Um, she, she was saying she was afraid that CJA was too big, too unwieldy. We needed to get something through just to save the jobs we had now because uh, there was all this uh, anticipation that the, the solar industry in Illinois was going to take off. Uh, after 2016 and it did not happen and in fact they've run out of money um and um at this point only one percent less than one percent of energy in illinois is is solar and and that is you know we're i'm just talking solar and not wind and other what other renewables right. we might have um why did that happen and uh, and are you afraid that maybe uh you're you're aiming too high and I, and I know that sounds terrible oh my god we're going to aim high i'm sorry i actually asked that question <laughs> no i i think it's a fair question to ask and you know two and a half years ago when we introduced the clean energy jobs act that was a concern are we going to be able to pass something that comprehensive uh, and obviously, two and a half years later, we're at a place where I think all of the stakeholders have realized that it's going to be a very comprehensive bill that is going to include not just the support that the renewable industry needs, but again, the workforce and equity components, addressing transportation emissions, which are now uh, the greater source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of Illinois, past uh, power sector emissions. So I think with eight days left in the legislative session, there's not a doubt that this will be a broad stroke energy bill, um, probably the most ambitious in the country. With the renewable piece, uh, you know, the Clean Jobs Coalition and IEC has certainly supported efforts to address that issue over the last two and a half years. There have been attempts just to, you know, expend the rollover dollars that are often talked about. Um, and, and of course, CJA does that, PATH does that. I think any energy bill that's passed by the end of this session will also uh, release some of the funds that the solar energy industry needs. Um, but in 2016 and 2017, before we started approaching this cliff, there was actually significant growth in the renewable industry. Uh, clean energy jobs traditionally grow at a rate 
four times that of the traditional job market. So we know there's a lot of interest and a lot of companies came to Illinois um, because of the uncertainty over the last couple of years. I think that slowed the pace of that growth. But come June 1st, I, I think we're going to see tremendous growth again. And, and that's why clean energy is so critical to be part of a COVID recovery plan as well. Yeah, uh, some of the folks in the clean industry, energy, are, are afraid that if w- this doesn't get passed and, and everything will grind to a halt and, and you will lose the inertia, lose the momentum that you had coming out of 2016, even now, as you say, a lot of folks came to Illinois with the, the prospect of, of having these kinds of jobs. And in fact, there were, I guess, more than 20,000 small solar jobs that were created uh, as a result of this. It just hasn't translated into uh, the larger jobs and a huge amount of that energy being provided to the state of, of Illinois. Um, and the funding ran out for them. They right. weren't given a fair well, chance. Well, and, and some of the funding is still there, but there's a mechanism they by which... Right. Yeah, can you explain that a little bit? Because that's a little uh, uh, hard to understand. Sure. So the Illinois Power Agency needs the authority to reopen these incentive programs that were recently closed and then release about $350 million in what we often call rollover funds that were held back largely just due to a, a small quirk in, in the Future Energy Jobs Act. So for, again, a year and a half now, you know, our environmental organizations and the renewable energy industry advocates have been saying, we have to fix this cliff. We know it's coming. And it, and it passed. Um, at the end of last year. So I'm, I'm confident that if we weren't able to get to a large energy bill, we would still be able to fix that mechanism because it is a relatively small policy tweak. Um, mm-hmm. But I think there's the right momentum to pass something large and comprehensive before June 1st. Um, and of course, you know, as dire as the solar job component of this is, I would say it's just as dire that we start working on just transition for coal plant communities, right? We already know that there are uh, four to five coal plants closing in the next just couple of years. Uh, And then on top of that, climate Mm -hmm. continues to be the most urgent pressing issue we have in our our society. So if we don't meaningfully work on decarbonization and reducing transportation pollution, so all of these urgent uh, crises um, on top of the economic crises that we're facing uh, really do pave the way for this really big uh, bill to pass in in just a short time now. And um, from what I understand, your bill and uh, the governor's bill as well are are seeking social justice. Uh, You mentioned that earlier. How do you... uh, How does that play out in the communities of color where most of the environmental pollution has happened? Um, You're you're attempting to remedy that, right? Yeah, I would say with the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and and I think the governor's bill does this uh, in a good way as well, equity really is baked into every single policy proposal we have, whether it's where are we putting electric vehicle charging infrastructure or where are we putting workforce hubs or to your point, environmental justice communities that have faced the burden of environmental pollution uh, purposefully, I would say, for for decades, how do we make sure that those communities are the ones that are bringing in new clean energy business? Um, Under the Future Energy Jobs Act, you know, we didn't have all of the preferencing that really helped make sure the solar projects and contracts were awarded to BIPOC owned businesses or in environmental justice communities. Instead, we saw a lot of solar projects, especially utility scale, going in Southern Illinois or places where, you know, there's significant land. But again, who is that best serving? And the communities that have faced all of this pollution should be top of the line for when we're talking about where solar projects need to happen. Um, So we really do focus on that. And then there's a lot of other provisions of the bill, um, even when we talk about energy efficiency or rate assistance, uh, you know, mm-hmm. things in which we need to make sure that the, the communities that have been most purposefully disinvested are getting the resources that they need 
um, and given a fair shot, uh, you know, truthfully, even when we talk again about the contracts, making sure that BIPOC owned uh, businesses have capital that they need, um, that's, you know, a barrier beyond just clean energy. So I would really say that social justice and equity has been at the center of what we've been trying to work on for two and a half years. And the governor's office and our legislative allies have been very clear that they won't support a bill that doesn't uh, uh, comprehensively address social justice as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget who, Kathleen would know the answer to this and because she tells me this all the time. Uh, and I don't know whether it's Eleanor Roosevelt or somebody else who said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care about who gets the credit. It's, I'm paraphrasing terribly, okay? Mm. So that takes me to the compromise part of this. So what if this ends up being called the governor's bill, uh, but there are a lot of uh, uh, aspects of CJA that are in, involved in this? Can you guys live with that? I mean, this is, as we're getting into the final week here, and you need to get something passed or things could possibly grind to a halt in Illinois regarding clean energy. Um, would you be uh, willing to accept that kind of compromise? Certainly. I think the most important thing to us is that this is a bill that addresses climate change in a broad way and includes decarbonization, that holds utilities accountable, and that centers social equity. And, you know, in 2018, when we went out into communities and we talked about what this should look like, we didn't have CJ yet. Right. We developed that bill through those conversations. So it's always been important to us that the policy is driven by communities and their local knowledge of what this should look like for them. Um, so the name of the bill, you know, it's a it, it, people are very invested in CJA, but not just because of what it's called, but because of what it really stands for. So um, I'm not sure what it will be called by May 31st. Uh, and as long as it has those policies in it, I think we'll support it. Yeah. Uh, and, and the one thing that I notice about the governor's bill that there seems to be some resistance to is the idea that he would allow natural gas through 2045. Mm -hmm. And that's a now, whole other conversation. That, that really is. And I, I, I don't I sure hope that doesn't hold up. Yeah. That that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Peggy? So, Colleen, if this goes through May 31st, what's the implementation time frame? Sure. Well, we're looking change. at about 900 pages of energy policy. So some of the things will happen within 30 to 60 days. You know, when we're talking about directing the Illinois Power Agency to release mm -hmm. those rollover funds. That can happen pretty quickly. There will be other pieces of a final bill that may take eight months, a year, et cetera. You know, the establishment of workforce hubs, making sure that community organizations that really want to help trainees and things like that, um, establishment of a green bank. It, you know, mm -hmm. some of these will be transformational and will take more time. Um, but there will certainly be a lot of attention on implementation because passing the policy is just the first yeah. step. Because there's a lot of projects just sitting out there waiting to go. But, you know, like we said, the funding's not there at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And again, how do we make sure that there are new projects in communities where there haven't been? And right. that, again, the expansion of projects doesn't just go to the same out of state, energy companies that it, they traditionally have. Yeah. Uh, and I want to circle back to one thing here before we let you go. Uh, cause, and, and again, it's ComEd, the uh, $2.3 billion uh, elephant in the room, uh, or gorilla, or however you want to look at them. Um, they're the still... Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> yeah, really. They're Exactly. They're using the oil that the Tyrannosaurus Rex mm -hmm. left behind uh, uh, 53 million years ago. Um, so uh, they're still making noises about their other plants needing to be propped up. Uh, where do you see that going, and how is that going to influence these negotiations? Sure. So so not necessarily ComEd, but Exelon. Uh, Excel, Exelon, Exelon, right, right. I get it. There. It's one's a subsidiary, so the, right. the line is not all, all clear in the sand there. But um, I would say that that is, again, something where we need to make sure that any ratepayer dollars that are going to support uh, our energy generation is based in reality and based in an independent audit, such as the one the governor's office did that says, you know, roughly 
the plants only need 70 million. I think at one point the proposal on the table was upwards of 500 million from Exelon themselves. Uh, And without, you know, really showing their map. So I think that that still is a significant piece to be determined in the next eight days. But I think it's been clear from the governor's office and legislative leaders that they're not willing to just give Exelon what they're asking for without a reason to really need to do it. And I don't know that they've proven that that's how much they really need. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, what happened to them last year and the idea that the feds are on their backs right now will give them a little bit of humility and uh, in moving forward on this. And I think that puts the, uh, the, uh, the folks who are interested in moving forward on clean energy a little bit of leverage, and let's hope that holds up at least through May 31st. Uh, Colleen Smith, Deputy Director, Illinois Environmental Council, thank you so much for enlightening us. If people want to have their voices heard, what do you advise them to do right now? Absolutely. I would go to ilcleanjobs.org or ilenviro.org, and you can find easy ways to contact your legislators and let them know that uh, the Clean Energy Jobs Act is important to you because you want a strong energy bill that is going to tackle climate change and hold utilities accountable and be rooted in social justice and equity. That's a great way of saying it. And of course, uh, both of those links and other links, uh, more information about, as I said, it's it's a difficult story to wrap your head around. Uh, you know it because you've been living it for years now. But folks who kind of, you know, glancingly uh, uh, view this will not... Uh, well, well, they should do some reading and just and, and yeah. see see what this is all about. Uh, so you can find a lot of those links at my website, mikenovak.net, in this week's blog. Uh, Colleen Smith, thank you so much. You uh, you have a great Sunday. Thank you both for having me. All have right, a great one. Uh, Thanks, me- Colleen. Meteorologist Rick DeMaio coming up next. You have the ability to give your soil a superpower. It's called composting. If you don't have a backyard, you need to contact Collected Resource Compost. CRC has diverted 7,000 tons of food scraps since 2010. They bring you a fresh 5-gallon bucket or a 32-gallon neighbor tote with each pickup. You fill it with organic matter from your kitchen, they swap it out and get it to a commercial composting operation. Fight climate change. Go to collectedresource.us. Since 2001, DiveHeart has been revolutionizing rehabilitation using zero gravity and scuba therapy to give confidence, independence, self-esteem, and yes, freedom to children, veterans, and others with disabilities. At DiveHeart, we believe in the power of partnership because together we can do great things. Let DiveHeart help you imagine the possibilities in your life. Go to DiveHeart.org to learn more. Whether you're a farmer or a backyard gardener, assist your soil in providing key nutrients to your plants with Spectrum Soil Inoculum from Tinyo Biologicals. The beneficial microorganisms in Spectrum break down and release vital nutrients and make them more accessible to your plants. Spectrum works with nature to decompose organic matter into humus, building richer, healthier soil. Spectrum is approved for use on certified organic crops and is OMRI listed. Get Spectrum at blazing-star.com. Oh, hi. I suppose you're wondering what an A-list celebrity like me is doing in a place like this. You must know, I'm saving the world. Oh, I bet. Yep, saving the world again. (laughs) Did you know that 40% of all the food produced in the United States is thrown away? That means everything that went into that food, the pesticides, the water, the land, was all for nothing. Just look at this perfectly good food thrown in the trash. The pizza with extra Cheerios. These goldfish and band-aid tacos. And just look at this perfect trash burger. This pasta dog looks delicious. You don't have to dumpster dive like Ed Begley Jr. to save the planet. Fight food waste by shopping smart and using what you buy before it gets trashed. That's way better. Ooh, arugula. Do your part and find out other world-saving tips at betterthaned.org. Ah, I gotta love that. I, I, <laughs> I was wondering where that was going. Uh, that's great. And that website is still up. I checked it. Uh, yeah. la- well, last, that looks pretty current in that. 
Yeah, yeah. He, but you know, he's got that blonde hair, so you'll never know yeah. when he when he goes gray. So he'll look the same age for forever. And of course, we're waiting for meteorologist Rick DeMaio to show up here. And uh, well, I, don't, I have uh, two that, things to add. Then okay. Um, so Kathleen, thank you. Posted. It is amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. Harry Truman said that. Harry Truman. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I I had the right era. So at least, yeah. uh, the, oh, there, yeah. and there's Rick DeMaio. And it's okay. also World Turtle Day. So happy World is, Turtle Is it Day. World, Rick, it's World Turtle Day, uh, just to let you know. Wow. Yeah. So uh, take a turtle to lunch. Uh-oh, Rick froze. Uh, eh, who cares? <laughs> he'll come back. I'm sure he'll he'll pop back in a second. Rick, then. you're frozen. Uh, but, but he seems like he's... At least he's not holding his nose like Beth was. Yeah. <laughs> I felt so bad. I'm so glad we 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 sent her upstairs there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, we, unfortunately, we missed her garden, but we did get to go upstairs. You know what? So. But she wasn't going to do a tour of it anyway. And and of course, this is the way these things work. As I said, when we tested it on Friday, clean as a whistle. I mean, just. Mm -hmm. Just abs oh, yeah. absolutely perfect. So, in fact, I'm going to adjust mine. <laughs> there, he, there he is. He went inside. Good. Oh, okay, come on. Fine. We we like the porch view, dude. Oh, gee. Yeah, but he looked like he was taking a nap on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, I got to either find a, a new place for a router or just um, maybe find someplace else that has stronger internet. But I'm okay now. Yeah, yeah. Or, or tether it off. Bring your phone outside and tether it off your phone. No, that uses up too much data. I'm with you. See, see, Rick and I get it. We, you, you do that, and it sucks up all the data, and then suddenly you're paying overage. It depends on your plan, I guess. That's well, cool. although I have to tell you, I okay, I have Credo, um, and they. Uh, I don't know if you folks know. They used to be. Well, nobody even remembers back in the day. They were called Working Assets, but Credo is a, a company that uh, is. It's a lefty company. Okay. Um, and it is a subcarrier of Sprint. Sprint just merged with T Rex, <laughs> T Mobile. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, and uh, but it doesn't matter because um, they handle it. I love Credo. Their service is impeccable, um, and um, one percent of whatever you pay goes to um, uh, progressive causes. Uh, and they're just the best in the world. And uh, I want to say like six months ago, I was talking to them and working and, and the woman on the line suddenly just said, oh, um, you're getting, <coughs> you're, you're getting three gigs of data. How about nine? I said, well, what's that going to cost me? She said, nothing. I'll just add it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I haven't even come cool. close, close to my limit since I'm like, yeah. So I can watch anything on my, on my cell phone. It's not unlimited, which is very different. But be not, you would probably have unlimited, Peggy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, there you go. But I love Credo. So anyway, I see the map is there, Rick. You've got the map oh, yeah. up. Well, the yeah, the map, map is up. back. The map is back. It's been here since we moved in. There you can see but it. But you've been outside, so. We have Yeah, yeah I've it. been outside only because um, we're only on one level now before I had three levels. Um, so I'm trying not to, you know, incorp I'm trying not to encroach on other people's, you know, space, things like that. But for <laughs> some reason, for some reason, um, the last couple of days, it seems like we've been soaking up, uh, too much. And I'm not getting a strong enough response. And even my, even my online class that I had Wednesday night at Oakton. It actually, um, it actually bogged down a couple of times as well. So I may have to do my Zoom classes when they start up in two weeks at Loyola. I may have to go down to campus to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not allowing me back into my office yet. It looks like I'm going to have to go into the IC, the Information Commons, and find a room and sequester myself and do my classes from there. Wow. So that That's an interesting uh, situation. Now we're in this weird phase where some people are invited back to work others are not um who knows what it's like going in i going into a restaurant uh, um you yeah. know i don't know it's going to be well, that way for a while yeah i mean i'm i was i was at a restaurant the other night we were sitting outside but the the bugs got a little bit too bad so we went inside and 
I mean, I'm fine. I've gotten my two shots and I'm okay. Yeah. I'm fine. I know, but I'm I'm telling you, there's a lot of folks who are hesitant and are going to continue to to bring their masks. Um, I break, I still bring mine with me, and mm-hmm. I don't care who knows about it. I really don't. So, right, yeah. I mean, public places like a Jewel or someplace else. Obviously, are you going to have to? I mean, I I actually start uh, jury duty on Monday um, downtown federal building. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm going to be doing grand jury duty. So, um, Mike and Peg, you're not up for anything that I have to worry about, do I? No, but I found out something. Uh, if you have a court case pending against you, you will not have to serve on a on a jury. Uh, I found that out when I uh, <laughs> last time I Got went into. Yeah, we won't you? talk about that. Yeah, that's that's, that's yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we won't we won't go into it. It's 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 civil, not criminal. Um, well, so. the bottom line is, I mean, the, all the all the different things that you have to go through now before you even serve on a jury, and this is for a grand jury. Um, oh my so that'll goodness! Be, yeah, yeah, that begins on Monday, so it'll be interesting mm. to see how that works out. So I was actually served the notice uh, two months before the pandemic hit, and everything went on hold. Wow! Uh, so now they, they track me down, and I'm I'm back in the jury pool. So uh, uh, we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. Well, just yeah. just make outrageous statements, and then if you if you don't want to go on it, but maybe you you know I'll tell you, I think everybody should serve on a jury at least once. Uh, I know oh, yeah. pe- a lot of people just try to dodge it. I. Uh, I was the foreman on a murder trial back in the 90s. Um, wow. Yeah, that was pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting stuff. So when I see murder trials, like watching the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Chauvin trial. Sherlock Holmes Rise or Perry Mason. No, 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 no. I'm talking about real life, like you know the Derek Chauvin oh. trial, and and hearing the the uh, what the jury's going through, and 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 you know the it they give you certain categories that you can convict oh, yeah. for. Um, and in mine, it was odd. It was either first degree, second degree, or acquittal. There was no manslaughter involved in it at all. So right. it, it limits what you can do and how you think about what you're doing as you're uh, uh, working on the trial. But anyway, yeah, I, and I, it was fascinating. And uh, I know yeah. the pe- people are always trying to duck juries, but it's oh, one no. of the things that keeps our, our country going. Yeah, real quickly, I've been on two juries, and one of them I was a foreman because it was a traffic accident, and the person said they couldn't see the um, the light because the sun was blinding them. And then when they yeah. found out I was a meteorologist, I was able to give them all the ins and outs. Um, and I'm sure the, the person who was looking for money because they felt that they couldn't see the light, when they found out that I was a meteorologist, they go, we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and were they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! See, yeah, that's don't, uh, don't go to trial with Rick on your jury. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want we'll scientists there. Yeah. So, so uh, speaking of sun and weather, yeah, we had that. We had that on Friday and a little bit Saturday. Today, um, it's Over, basically overcast, as, windy. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, I, see. Okay. Okay. I, I I can't go down that road because cloud clouds are fine, uh, especially yeah. in yeah. May when it's eighty five degrees. Yeah. And I'm thinking, and things are all drying up. I'm thinking, can we can we mitigate this a little bit? And and it looks like we're going to. Yeah. Can we can we pump up the rain? Believe it or not, a lot of the high cloud cover um, is moisture that came all the way northward from the tropical depression that formed over the Gulf of Mexico. So hmm. this thing came literally all the way northward around what we call the Dirty Ridge, um, and it actually just kept spreading eastward. It was a little wave in the atmosphere kind of rippled out a couple of sprinkles about an hour ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's this yeah. big area of low pressure over um, Hudson Bay that's pushing the cold front down the lake. Um, and I just checked the last hour, the temperature in Sturgeon Bay is 40, 40, actually it's 53 in Sturgeon Bay, 55 in Manitowoc, and 48 up in Egg Harbor, and it's only 39 in Sawyer, Michigan. So uh, the, wind has, wow. the wind has flipped. The cold front is coming south, and it'll probably be reaching Peg at about three thirty, four o'clock. Uh, the Evanston area about four o'clock, and downtown Chicago about five. And you'll literally see people running from the shoreline um, as that front comes through. But I don't think there's going to be a lot of people, um, as many as at the beach today, only because the cloud cover and a couple of sprinkles. But yeah. you know, you get you get eighty two, eighty three degrees on a day like today, and it's Sunday, and the beaches are yet officially not open. 
so you don't have to pay. You can do whatever you want. Um, there's going to be the beaches were packed yesterday, and the water temperature is only 58 degrees. So it's probably okay to go in there up to about your calves, and that's about it. Well, uh, I, yeah. just to let you know, we don't pay in Chicago. Just, just saying. Right, right. <laughs> but you can, you can, you can go beyond the buoys, and you could do all the different things that the lifeguards typically mm-hmm. tell you not to do. You yeah. can do launch fees, whatever. Yeah. 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 This, yeah oh, I stuck my like, fingers in the lake the other day, and it's that low mid fifties. Is pretty cold. Yeah, it's pretty cold. I, I, I liken this to be like an eighth grade, and you have a substitute teacher. You can do whatever you want and get away with it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have, uh, Peggy noted, and I've noted uh, that even the local meteorologists are talking about the drought in our area. Yeah. You know, and that's a good that's a good thing. I'm glad I'm glad that that is that is happening. Yeah, and I think part of that is because the National Weather Service uh, provided a really great link, and I gave this to you guys. You can share it, um, you know, with your listeners. Um, or your streamers, whatever you want to call them. Um, and what's really nice about what they did was they basically built a page that has links that are updated daily. So you don't have to try mm-hmm. to find the information. You can go in there and get it, um, literally just clicking on one of those images. Um, and I think that's really, that's really good stuff to have. Mm-hmm. And, um, again, there, there's two different ways to look at a drought, short-term and long-term. And one of the other links that I sent you this morning um, is what we call an impact statement from a drought. And if you look at an impact, an impact is based on long, medium, or I should say short, medium, and long-term weather projections. So if you look at the drought out west, we know that once you get past the middle of May, it's really hard to get substantial rainfall. So the impacts of the drought out there are going to be much, much worse than the impacts of what I call our short-range drought that's over us right now. Now, well, granted, yeah. we, we, are in, we are in severe drought. It is a small area, but the chances Oops. of nullifying that drought between now and probably the first week of July are still pretty good. It's not like it's an expansive drought, um, and it's not like we're going into a, a large-scale dome of high pressure that looks like it's going to set up shop and stay here for the next, you know, two months. If this was the first week of July, I'd be concerned, but I'm really mm-hmm. not, especially from an agricultural standpoint. And it's also important to point out the fact that the lake levels have responded nicely to the dry weather. They're down 15 inches, which is great wow. news. Yeah. And, more from yeah, last week. Yeah, it's almost it's almost three inches more from last week, Peg, because we've had some warmer weather and some evaporation. Um, and this is why I get a little bit bothered by, you know, even, you know, TV stations, which will run these specials on climate change and high lake levels, that's like reporting on a house that's on fire, as opposed to reporting on the prevention that you do to keep a house from going on fire. To me, that's the story. But you're going to have up and down lake levels with a variable climate. So climate change doesn't always mean high lake levels. In fact, if you're going to talk about climate change, talk about the fact that we're in a drought, and this has actually helped the lakes. So mm-hmm. you can talk about it, but talk about it in a way that, that covers both sides. Because what's going to happen is you're going to open yourself up to people criticizing. I've already seen some of these posts on Facebook that I've seen people say, oh, what about this climate change you guys are talking about, but the lakes are down 15 inches. I actually responded to a person who has a fairly – um, right-wing, uh, very popular radio show in Detroit. I found his post, and I looked at this, and I'm like, wow, this guy just completely went, you know, off the charts here. And I don't normally do that, but I just wanted to kind of educate him on certain things. Mm-hmm. And he came back, and he says, I never really thought of it that way. And all I was just trying to do was just to give him both sides of the story here. Yeah. So even though we're in a severe drought, it's still small scale. It could still be eradicated with one or two heavy rain events. Uh, but the medium and long-term impacts over a large area at this point are actually fairly low. Let's uh, can we you, you here's that uh, map that uh, you sent us, um, and this is uh, of the Midwest here, and and it it is just to me, Rick, so mm-hmm. fascinating that you can have that little. I mean, sure, there's there's 
moderate and abnormally dry conditions stretching from Iowa uh, across to Michigan. But that little area that surrounds Chicago, does that have anything to do with Heat Island or is that just something altogether different? Well, I, I think it's just random precipitation. Okay. Um, so, so here's the thing. I saw someone plant a whole bunch of flowers, you know, basically annuals, and I down my down my block. And then three days later, I looked at them, and they were all dried up. And I'm thinking to myself, this is where you want to at least use this information to help you plant something different and not have to worry about planting it and watering it like crazy because this is the same thing you planted year after year after year. Plant something different because this could still, in, in a small area, become much worse, especially as we mm -hmm. go into uh, the middle of June and maybe into early July. But again, I still think if you just look at the pattern for this week, rain coming in here on Thursday, uh, potentially into Friday as well, it's still a highly variable pattern. Again, if it was the... Um, end of June, I'd be a little bit more worried. So as you see the seven-day rainfall forecast, notice there's a lot of rain to the north, a lot of rain mm -hmm. out to the west, but it's still like right over us, we seem to be in the 0 0.7, which is basically will get us maybe to six inches below normal by the time we get to the end of next week. So again, it, it's not, not, to, not to run across the street with your hair on fire, um, it's not a it's not a high impact event. It's a low impact event, but it's enough where you're talking about the third largest city in the United States, and you got severe drought, and people are looking to plant, and they're going, okay, why am I watering? Why am I watering? Why am I watering? Have you been following the news? And I think it's important for people. Just you can get sciency and go, yeah, you know, maybe we should do something different. So I don't have to worry so much about watering because all you need to do is go away for a week on vacation, come back, and everything that you planted is done. It, it, it basically died if you don't get the water. But the thing is, good news is we're going to get some rain this week. The bad news, it's not enough, uh, and it certainly doesn't cover a large, a large enough region to put a major dent in the drought. It looks uh, from this map, and, I was, and I've been watching the radar the last few days, it, and it's been so odd because – uh, we're used to weather patterns coming west to east. A lot of them have been coming south to north, almost straight up from the Gulf of Mexico. And and it looked like there was a big high-pressure center and, and everything to the west of us was bringing up rain and we were not uh, getting right. any of that. So, and so it looks like some of the drought is being mitigated in Iowa a little bit. Yeah, yeah. matter of fact, they've had three consecutive days of rain um, across Iowa and parts of Missouri. So the pattern is one where you got this big low over the west, big high over the east. Um, you know, if you were watching the PGA tournament on Thursday and Friday, it was perfectly clear. I mean, you couldn't get any clearer weather along the coast of South Carolina. Yesterday they had some high clouds. It was the same clouds that we had on Friday. So everything is just kind of like going north, kind of making that turn to the east and literally coming all the way down the east coast. And you'll get into these patterns um, every once in a while. This is very typical for the month for the month of May. So yeah, it's been really, really beneficial uh, rainfall out across portions of Iowa. Now, you're going to begin to see farmers get a little bit worried in the first week or two of June, because right now, I think only about 6% of the corn has emerged, less than 3% of the soybeans have emerged. But when you start to get you know, warmer weather, higher levels of humidity, warm overnight lows, those plants will begin to grow. And what they're doing now is they're looking for some moisture, some precipitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's during that next two-week period of time where the farmers, the last thing they want to do, um, if you have 5,000 acres of land, break out the irrigation equipment. Uh, you want to you do that, you know, late July, early August, once your plants really need to get the rain, you know, really need to get the uh, the liquid into their root system. But right now they're, they're just kind of waiting for a little bit of rain to get going. Um, and uh, I noticed that uh, the, the temperatures are moderating a little bit in the next week, at least in this area. Is that uh, across the Midwest in general? Yeah. I mean, low to mid eighties today, we'll have that weak cool front come down the lake uh, again, between about three or four o'clock in the afternoon. I say weak, but if you live near the lake, anywhere within a mile or two, it'll be about a 20 degree difference. Um, in about an hour. 
Uh, we actually had a little bit of a lake breeze come through here Friday evening for about two or three hours. Yeah. So even even though we will get up to like 80 to 83 today, maybe 84, 85 tomorrow and Tuesday, front comes through on Wednesday, cools things off, rain goes south of us, and then we'll get a much better chance of rain for Thursday and Friday. But what's interesting, Mike and Peg, if – you look at some of the Twitter feeds out of the National Weather Service office from Sacramento, uh, from San Francisco, from Monterey, which I think is the same office, from uh, Los Angeles and down around, I believe it's somewhere in the San Fernando Valley, like Hanford. There are, I think now, 39 counties that have been declared disaster areas, yeah, because of the fact that it's so dry, so early, in that part wow. of the state, and yeah, and they know that going into you know June, July, and August, you don't get a lot of rain out there. So mm-hmm. this is going to be the big story. Um, and not only that, but the reservoirs are already at uh, record lows for this time of the year. Uh, mm-hmm. The snow back in the mountains is down to like less than fifteen percent, which is phenomenal for this. Usually, it's around thirty or forty percent. So to me. This is the story that's developing across the country. Um, again, California, Southern Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, phenomenally dry. Uh, but what's really odd is areas of the Deep South, um, Eastern Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, since March 1st, they've had nearly three feet of rain. So again, these are the type of things that we're seeing with these kind of bogged down patterns we're seeing more and more of. Where it gets dry, it stays dry. Where it gets wet, it stays wet. So when you start to get these areas of extreme wetness, usually beginning in early March and and, and, we'll say mid to late March, it stays there and it it doesn't move. And I think that actually bodes well for us. The fact that it's so wet in the deep south kind of keeps the heat somewhat abated in that area. So if we're going to get above normal temperatures this summer – I wouldn't be surprised if it's more northern plains, Great Lakes, into the northeast. That's where your hot weather uh, is going to stay. So we're seeing some of these signals already begin to show themselves. And even though we had Tropical Storm Anna uh, develop north of Bermuda, it's a non-tropical. It's not the type of storm that develops off the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico or the Gulf Stream. This just basically formed... In, warm, in, in a warm environment. So we call it a non-tropical, tropical system. Uh, but it has nothing to do with the tropical storm season. What does, though, is the fact that the National Hurricane Center issued their um, long-term outlook for the season. It shows still above normal temperatures, or above normal temperatures, above normal activity, uh, not as much as last year. But it's easy to say not as much last year when last year was record. Okay, so we're somewhere yeah. in between 14 to 16 storms. What's interesting, though, is the 30-year normal. Remember, we were talking about that two weeks yeah. ago. Instead of being 10 to 12, we're now 12 to 14. So mm-hmm. not only do temperatures and precipitation get a jump, but also the number of tropical storms that you now expect each year has gone up as well. Whether or not you're going to have landfalling hurricanes, that's always a real tough call. I mean, even last year, we had 30, uh, 30 tropical storms and hurricanes combined, and we had, I think, seven of them were landfalling hurricanes, yet only one was a, was a major hurricane. And if you look at even the seven hurricanes that came on shore, total damage was about $51, 52000000000 billion. You compare that with the three that came on shore in 2017, that was $335 billion. So wow. you, you can, it's, it's really hard to say how many storms are going to occur and whether or not they're going to produce a lot of damage. It all has to do with, does it hit Houston? Does it hit Miami? You know, mm-hmm. does it make a, a huge number of people leave? So again, it, it's important to note that while we're talking weather and climate here, we're really talking impact as well, which is why yeah. that, that other link that I sent you with the impact out west is so much greater than the impact here in the Midwest mm-hmm. from a drought standpoint. Uh, does it, uh, and then we'll have to do a quick forecast. Um, uh, does Is the setup any different in uh, uh, for the hurricane season this year? Um, it, it, it's a little bit similar to last year, only because 
Last year, we went into the season with a very strong La Nina event. And generally what happens with La Nina is you cool down the eastern Pacific, which weakens the subtropical jet. And the reason why it's important is when you weaken the subtropical jet coming across Central America, you allow these storms to kind of blossom. In other words, during strong El Ninos, what happens is you warm the atmosphere, you tighten the temperature gradient, and you increase the winds in the upper levels of the atmosphere. When that happens, it shears off the tops of the hurricanes. So strong El Ninos, you get less hurricanes. Strong La Ninos, you get more. That's generally speaking. That's only one of like maybe three or four components that create an active season. We've seen when you get really, really hot weather in Europe, you develop this enormous high pressure system that on the south end of it, you bring air across the Mediterranean and North Africa. And what you end up doing is you take all that sand, you blow it across the Caribbean, and you actually suppress the development of storms. So hmm. there's a lot of things to really look at when you get into the tropical storm season. The one thing that we do know for sure is ocean temperatures continue to be above normal in all four basins, Indian Ocean, um, the Western Pacific, um, the Eastern Pacific, and also the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. And as long as you continue to have above normal temperatures, um, sea surface temperature-wise, the chances of just being slightly above normal is greater. And as I mentioned to this post that I sent back to this one guy who is just basically took, he, this, I, I love these because he was talking about prehistoric climate. You can't take science from 50 million years ago and apply it to the next 100 years. <laughs> sure you that can. Tyrannosaurus Rex. Yeah. <laughs> that, right. That makes no sense. So when people say, yeah, but it did that before. Fine, but we didn't have 300 million people in the United States and 8 billion people worldwide. The science does not apply. It, it just, <laughs> yeah. I don't understand that. Uh, but the bottom line is the impacts themselves. Um, and again, I, I say it so many times, you know, south, southeast, and across the desert southwest. You know, people say, I, I love living in the south. Take away their air conditioning for a week in the middle of June and see how much they like living in the south. Yeah. All right, give us a forecast and we'll get out of here. All right, cloudy today, a couple of sprinkles, 80 to 83. Front comes through about 3 or 4 o'clock. Uh, it'll start out a little cool tomorrow morning, but then right back up to the low to mid 80s. Monday and Tuesday, I think, look okay. Rain, though, Tuesday night into Wednesday, about a half inch, and then a really nice wave of low pressure moves through. Both Thursday and Friday, miserable. Temperatures in the 50s, strong wind off the lake. Wow. Um, but it looks like we'll probably, oh, yeah. Thursday and Friday look terrible. If that wave goes south, the heavier rain stays south. But I do think by this time next week, we'll add at least three quarters to about an eighth, eighth of a tenth, eight tenths of an inch of rain to the rain gauge. And we'll see if that holds true. Right. Well, I'll be checking my my rain gauge. I, yeah, I my, actually, my, my rain gauge is dry. Yeah. There, yeah. there has been. They, they're going to call, they're gonna call you now Puddle County instead of Lake County. <laughs> All right. Uh, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Let's let's do it right. Yep. Here we go. Oh, there I you thought you're bringing the screaming marmot back. Uh, I I could do that. I I ha don't have it set up for Rick here, so I'll bring the screaming mar marmot back uh, when when we get rid of Rick here. So Rick, thank you so much. You have a, a great Sunday. Um, uh, just to let you know, and I'm sorry, I'm I'm sort of uh, uh, sucker punching you here. Uh, we're taking a week off next week. Uh, Memorial Day. It's like I need a break. It's uh, we'll just uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. So enjoy your weekend, and uh, we'll hey, we'll talk real, in a couple. Real quickly, real sure. quickly, I rode my bike from Evanston down to Montrose Harbor. Did a little birding this morning. Yeah, the bird sanctuary down there was packed with people. Wow, there we. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's good, and it's bad. As long as they're being respectful, that's good. Uh, so all right. Well, thanks, Rick. All right, we'll talk to you next week or, or two weeks two weeks from now. All right, take care. Uh, and there we have it. I was going to, um, let's see, I can, pop, if I pop up this and get rid of these guys, there we go. Um, I can, now I can go to, uh, Mr. Marmot if I can find, because I, yeah, I, it's important that we see him one more time today before we get into...
Okay. <laughs> oh, oh man, boy. that is my new favorite thing in the world. So, okay, so now we get to do this. Ah, oh, wait, let's tilt down. All right, there we go. Thanks to everybody on the show today, Beth Botts, uh, and, and thank her for taking her computer and going up the stairs uh, because of the technical difficulties. Uh, thanks to Colleen Smith from the Illinois Environmental Council, meteorologist Rick DeMaio, Kathleen doing running around and doing whatever she does upstairs, which is a lot. Working um, her magic. Lagata the cat who disappeared on me, Basil the dog, who we did not hear today. Woof. And woof. And until next time, go green. No, until or, June 6th. Until June go 6th. Green. Well, that's next time. Go green yep. or go home. Yes. It's over. How'd you like it? I don't know. I slept through the whole thing. Well, you didn't miss much. Ha <laughs> ha!